Got us going? Okay. Uh, anybody remember November 22nd, 1963? What, what happened on that day? <laughs> that was the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy. I was on a field trip. I think I was in the fourth grade at the art museum when the security guard came up to our teacher and whispered in her ear something. We didn't know what it was, but she said, children, we have to get back on the bus and go back to school. And so as we were coming back to the school, Brian Hill School, she told us that the president had been assassinated. And today is the 21st anniversary of 9-11. Uh, I was at an executive board meeting up in Springfield, Illinois for the Illinois Baptist Association, and we had had our meeting the day before, and then we were supposed to start our meeting at 8 o'clock uh, that morning. And I came down to the hotel at Hampton Inn there to have breakfast and saw this on the TV. I thought it was, I first thought it was the Sears Tower in Chicago that a plane had, had crashed into it. But then as we sat there, we saw the second one. And then we had to go to our meeting, and we had actually had an FBI agent that was part of the IBS board. And about every 15 minutes, he was stopping us and giving us update of what was going on and how the towers collapsed. I, I alluded to this psalm, I think, last week. I thought it was Psalm 85, but it's Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt, and you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. Mountains were covered with its shade, and mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all who move in the field feed upon it. Turn again, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire, they have cut it down. May they perish in the rebuke of your face. Let your hand be on the man of your right hand, the son of man whom you made strong for yourself, that we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. That ought to be our prayer for America and for this world because our only hope is in the true and living God. Um, let's stand together and we're going to sing No, Not One. Oh, the 
sing one of my favorite songs is Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul. It's good to be here this morning, and we do want to remember our nation and um, remember the families that lost loved ones. We all know that, in fact, uh, a week ago yesterday was the day my mom passed away, September 3rd, uh, 1993. And it um, doesn't matter how long it's been, it still uh, touches our heart, and uh, we deal with those realities. But... In reality, I think of my mom with Jesus, you know, um, and so I'm blessed by that and, and reassured by that. Same with my dad, my sister, and all our loved ones that have gone on before us. But it's still, we still deal with the pain in our heart, and so we want to lift up one another and those that lost loved ones on this day uh, 21 years ago. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for who you are, that you are the true and living God, that you sit upon your throne above the cherubim. And the Father, your throne is never shaken. It's never moved. It's never challenged. Father, you reign in all of your sovereignty and all of your wisdom, all your holiness, righteousness, and justice. And Father, we just pray that you would cause your face to shine upon us. Father, to bring healing to this land, but not only this land, Father, but to all of your creation. We know that day is coming, Lord. The day of the Lord is coming when the Lord Jesus will return. And this world will be purged of its fallenness, of its sin, of its brokenness. And you'll bring a new heaven and a new earth in which all who believe on your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will share in that blessing. But, Father, we also know that those who fail to believe will not share in that blessing, but be eternally separated, Father. So, Father, we pray that um, we would humble ourselves before you, Lord, and truly seek your face and turn from sin that is in our heart. That, Father, you might rend the heavens and come down. Father, the other psalmist cried out, which we'll sing in just a moment, Revive us, O Lord. Bring revival to us. Bring new life. Bring new vitality. Bring freshness, Father, to us by your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for Dennis and Carol and uh, Carol and Dale. We pray again. We ask you to continue to bless Fran as she recovers. And others, Father, that we have on our prayer list, we lift them up to you, Lord, and ask for your blessing, ask for your grace, ask for your mercy. And Father, knowing that though our outward man perishes day by day, the inner man's being renewed day by day. And may that be so, Father. May our spirit grow in power and strength and in faith and victory. Even though, Father, we face the trials of this life, Father, may we be more than conquerors through him who loved us. 
So, Father, we pray for the families that lost loved ones 21 years ago. We pray, Father, in the midst of the darkness of this hour, that the light of the gospel will shine brightly, that Jesus will be exalted, and that, Father, you'll draw men unto him. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. So, Father, may we lift him up in the proclamation of the gospel, in the transformation of our lives, that the light of Jesus might shine in this dark world. And, Father, again, I pray intentionally that those without Christ that hear the gospel today, that, Father, by your grace, you'll draw them to Jesus. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And I have to do some repair here. My uh, pickup for this guitar was put in down here at the bottom, and the catch for my guitar strap is too big for my guitar strap, so I have to use this adapter, and sometimes it comes untied. Bingo. Right. So let's sing Revive Us again. We praise thee, O Lord, by the Son of thy love. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thy the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah. I try to have a song about heaven most of the time, just remind us that um, that's where we're headed in the sweet by and by. Stand together as we sing of this land fairer than day. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can sing. In the 
Well, we're continuing the Gospel of Mark, and uh, I forgot my notes, so we can just go home now. And uh, but no, I've I got them on the board here. So we're going to begin in verse thirty-one and go through verse forty-five. Um, this is the third time Jesus shares with his disciples. Um, where he's going and uh, it's a road that he you know there's a spiritual says Jesus walked that lonesome valley he had to walk it by himself and we're going to kind of focus on that a little bit this morning as well as what Jimmy and Johnny did in coming to Jesus with their mommy and um, we'll uh, look at that also if you're able to stand with me as we read God's word And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him. And flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. And James and John the sons of Zebedee came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one on your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, We're able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you, Father, for doing what the law could not do in sending your Son in the likeness of sinful flesh that he might condemn sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be imputed to us, might be fulfilled to us, Father, by your grace. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to help us to understand your word, because without him we can't. 
And Father, help us to really consider and ponder the great price that was paid to ransom us from ourselves and from sin and from hell. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We, we kind of wonder, um, how did Jesus know all this stuff? Well, I think, as others have said, I think twofold. Once Jesus knew his Bible. He, he knew the Old Testament. I've told you before, I think Jesus had a photographic memory because he wasn't tainted with sin like we are. You know, some say that we only use 10% of our brain. Uh, I think a lot of pundits on TV use a lot less, but... Um, That's another story. Um, But Jesus' brain was not affected by sin and by the fall. I think he had, probably his IQ was off the charts. And I think he he had a photographic memory and and he remembered everything he heard, everything he saw. And he was growing up as a boy in the synagogue uh, every Sabbath. And in the synagogue they had schools for the children to learn the scriptures. And so I personally believe Jesus even by a young age of 12, because he confounded the scribes and Pharisees there in Luke's gospel there in Jerusalem as a 12-year-old boy uh, with the scriptures. And um, so Jesus knew what the scriptures said about him. And uh, it's all there in the scripture, being betrayed, uh, being turned over, rejected, uh, being beaten uh, by his stripes we were healed, uh, his back was offered up for us, and uh, it's all there in the Old Testament. But on the other side, Jesus is the God-man, and, and um, uh, in his omniscience as God, uh, at times Jesus exercised that. We see that with the woman at the well. Uh, when he met her, he knew all about her. He said, she said, when she went in back to the Sychar, she said, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. And even in John's gospel, in the first chapter, in the closing verses, I think the first chapter, uh, John writes, Jesus knew what was in the heart of man and did not give himself to them because he knew what was in the heart of man. Uh, It was an incomplete faith. It was a fickle faith. It was a rejection of him. Uh, So at times, Jesus, in his deity, exercised that omniscience, and he knew. As we'll see... Uh, when they were preparing for the Passover at the, his, after his triumphal entry, he said, you're going to man- see a man carrying a jug. How do you know that? Because he's God. And ask him. Because he's going to have a donkey and a, and a fold of a donkey that no one's ever written on. And ask him, say, the master needs this, and he'll give it to you. He'll release it. Because he's God. He's the God man. And um, so... This is the third time Jesus speaks to his disciples about this. I don't think it's the only time, but it's the third time that all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, record all three times, and they all give a little bit of nuance, which we'll see in just a moment. In fact, that's part of what Luke says um, when Jesus talks to them. I got new glasses that are that I should be wearing because they're progressive lenses, but... I was telling Sandy, if I move my head just slightly, everything goes like this. And uh, in the condition of my head to this morning, I just don't feel like uh, riding on a ship and getting seasick. Okay. So in Luke's gospel, um, his account is, taking the 12, he said to them, see, we're going to Jerusalem and and." Everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Jesus knew what was in the prophets. In fact, as, we, as I've shared with you many times before, in the last chapter of Luke, when Jesus meets the two guys on the road uh, to Damascus and sits down with them, once they realize, you know, that's one of the most Uh, profound statements made in in the Gospels as these two guys are going back to Emmaus and they're dejected because their Messiah has been killed and and Jesus kind of walks up alongside them and 
and he asked them, um, uh, what's the conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood, they stopped, and they look at him and says, um, one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? You know, how ironic that is. Jesus is the only one that really knew what happened that day. But they didn't understand who he was. And then um, when they sit, sits down with them and they realize who he is, in verse 25, he says, O foolish ones and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. It's all been there. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning him. And then later on, one of the last things he does with his disciples, with the apostles, in verse 44, he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures because that's the basis of our faith. The scriptures is where we stand, where we, what we believe, the testimony of the word of God. Now, there are many uh, so-called scholars in the last 150, 60, 70 years they said Jesus just went too far. He really didn't, he didn't mean to be killed. He just went too far. He got caught up in all the enthusiasm, and he got trapped, and he got killed. Um, that that really wasn't his purpose. But as we read the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples, I must go to Jerusalem. And so Jesus is resolved. He's going to take the road to Jerusalem. In Isaiah 50, the Bible speaks of him prophetically that he sets his face toward Jerusalem like a flint, like a rock, immovable. He's got his gaze upon his destination. In fact, even as we read about him being a 12-year-old boy, he says, I must be about my father's business, he said to his mother, Mary, and his stepfather, Joseph. His father's business was redemption. His father's business was the cross. And Jesus knew, I think, from a very early age that his, he was going to go on a road that was going to be a lonely road, but it was a road that was to fulfill the will of the Father. So Jesus' resolve is to go to Jerusalem. The disciples, and what our text tells us, they were amazed and they were frightened. Because they knew that the Pharisees and the scribes and, as we saw earlier, even the Herodians were plotting together to kill Jesus. Very early on in his public ministry, that was set in motion already. And they weren't backing off from it. And um, so they knew. In fact, in John's Gospel, I think it's in chapter 11, when Jesus is going to go and deal with Lazarus and Martha and Mary, I think it's Thomas said, well, let's all go. Let's all go to Jerusalem and all get killed. Let's all, let's just go with him and die. Because they knew that it was a dangerous thing for him to go back to Judea and particularly go back to Jerusalem. And Jesus knew it was a road of betrayal. It's prophesied in Zechariah that uh, 30 pieces of silver were going to be given from him. Jesus wasn't surprised by Judas. In fact, as in John's gospel, there at the Last Supper, the Bible says Satan had entered Saint Judas, and Jesus said, one of you going to betray me, and um, Peter motions to John, because John was Jesus' right side most likely, and leaning against his shoulder, and Peter motions to him, ask him who it is, and Jesus said to him, the one that I dip this bread and give it to. Now, there's no indication that John understood that it was Jesus, or if he didn't understand it was Jesus, that he announced that to the rest of the disciples. But right after that, Jesus said to Judas, what you must do, do quickly. And the Bible says he departed and went and betrayed Jesus. It was a road of mocking. They mocked him in his arrest. They mocked him as he hung on a cross. They mocked him 
You know, that's one of, one of the verses, our words there in um, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, where it says, I hear my mocking voice along with the crowd. Um, because uh, without the grace of God, we would have mocked Jesus too. And they, they cried out to him, you saved others, save yourself, come down from the cross. But I'm so glad he didn't, because if he would have came down, we'd have no hope. Uh, the the Gentiles that he was turned over to mocked him. That's part of when they scourged him. They're, they're the ones that put the crown of thorns on him. They're the ones that took a, a, a scarlet robe and wrapped it around him. They're the ones that mockingly knelt before him and then struck him and beat him and ultimately scourged him. It was a road of contempt. They spit upon him. There's, I don't think there's much more uh, epitome of contempt. And you see, I see it on Facebook every once in a while where somebody will spit in somebody's face. And they spit upon him and uh, ridiculed him. Jesus knew all this was coming. But he was determined to go and to suffer. Uh, and there was a road of suffering. Um, the beating that he had, as they, uh, even with the first trial with the, at, before Caiaphas and Sanhedrin, they struck him and, and uh, abused him. And then they sent him to Pilate. And Pilate, as we read the scriptures, questioning Jesus, couldn't find anything worthy of death. And so he thought, well, I'll just scourge him, and that will appease their anger, and then I can let him go. And so, Jesus, so Pilate had him scourged. And if you've watched the Passion of Christ, that's one thing I think Mel Gibson got right the horrific scourging of Jesus. In fact, it was such an exhausting um, task by the lectors that did it that there were generally two of them that did it because it was so exhausting to them, much less to the one who was being scourged. And you see the bloody body of Jesus in that movie, and that's probably pretty close to what Jesus really experienced. And Pilate thought that would be sufficient. And so after he scourged him, he brought Jesus out and said, Behold the man. He thought that would appease the hatred, the anger in the hearts of the religious leadership. But it didn't. Uh, because Jesus told them earlier, You are of your father, the devil. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And that's what they had in their heart was murder. And by the way, uh, I've always believed that the whispers of suicide is, are coming directly from the pit of hell. Because the thief cometh not but to kill, steal, and destroy. And it was certain death. Jesus knew he was going to die. That's what he said at the last verse here. He says, the Son of Man came to give himself as a ransom for many. Jesus knew he was going to die. And as that, those hours come closer and closer, we see the great extent of that weighing upon him in the garden of Gethsemane when he sweat drops of blood. And I don't think it was just the physical death that Jesus was dealing with. Jesus knew he was going to bear our sin. He who knew no sin. We can't, I've told you before, we can't comprehend that. We are so familiar with sin and it in our heart and and, and exercising it, and in some ways, the Bible says in Hebrews, we're talking about Moses, that he, forsake, he forsook the life of Egypt because it was pleasure for a season, but only lasts for a season, and the eventuality is death. And there is pleasure in sin, and we embrace that pleasure, but we forget and we're deceived of the consequence of sin that it destroys. And Jesus was going to bear our sin. He who knew no sin was going to bear that sin. And I think that was the most horrific thing he struggled with, uh, to embrace our sin. But he willingly did. But also it was a life-giving victory. All three times he said, but on the third day I will rise. They never got it until after he rose. In fact, what, what Luke says in his account uh, back there in, in Luke 18, um, 
when after he said verse 33 and and after flogging him they will kill him and on the third day he will rise but they understood none of these things this saying was hidden from them and they did not grasp what was said and we see that in our text here because immediately after Jesus tells his disciples this horrific event that he's going to experience once he gets to Jerusalem here comes Jimmy and Johnny I, I use that because Dr. Muncie did that when I was in college. He, said, he talked about Jimmy and Johnny coming with their mommy to Jesus. In fact, I forget which, I think it's uh, Luke. Um, no, I think it's Matthew. Matthew says their mom, Salome. Most believe that Salome was the mother of James and John, and most believe that Salome was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so really James and John were cousins to Jesus. Maybe that they thought is, hey, cuz, Give us what we want. But the whole picture is that their mom comes with them thinking maybe, you know, uh, I love my aunts. Uh, I only had aunts on my mom's side other than married aunts, and I really didn't know them very well. On my dad's side, he only had one brother. But I grew up with my aunts, my mom's sisters. And they were they were some of my favorite people. And... Um, uh, great memories of experience with my aunts. You know, they say uh, your first friends as a kid are your cousins, you know, and then in that closeness uh, with those families. And so maybe Aunt Salome thought she'd have some sway over Jesus. Maybe she, she thought, I'm his favorite aunt, you know. So they come to Jesus let me just, let me touch this first. I forgot I had this on here. And Jesus walked this road alone. He was rejected by his people, forsaken by his disciples, or uh, abandoned by his disciples and forsaken by his God. Jesus walked this treadmill alone. Now, one way he had to walk alone because only he was worthy. Now, there is a mystery that as we read and study in Romans and uh, uh, Galatians and, and other aspects of the New Testament, there is a reality that we died with Jesus. That's what Paul says, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. But that's in, in relationship that he was our substitute, and he accomplished what we could not do. He paid the price that we could not pay. But as far as dealing with our sin and bearing our sin, he died alone because he alone was worthy. But he was rejected by his people. John says this way in the first chapter of John. He came into his own creation. You know, it's translated, he came into his own, but that's neuter there. So it's really he came into his own creation. And his own people, that own there is in masculine, so it's his own people received him not. The God of all creation entered into his own creation and the people that had been called to him uh, through Abraham and through the Abrahamic covenant and through the divinic covenant and this relation in the Mosaic covenant that had been called to him. He came into his own creation, but his own people that should have known him and should have recognized him received him not. He was rejected by them. And then when they came to arrest him, his disciples abandoned him. And we, don't, we can't comprehend this. I think it's only in his humanity that he cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in his deity, the Father and Son can never be separated. The Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, can never be divided, never be separated. But in Jesus' humanity, he cries out from Psalm 22, My God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? There's a contemporary song. Uh, one of the verses says, um, I'm forgiven because he was forsaken. Because he paid the price for our sin. And here comes Jimmy and Johnny. They had a presumptuous request. Again, this is the third time Jesus is trying to tell them. Again, Luke tells us it went over their head. They just didn't comprehend. They were in the dark. What they were thinking about, he's the Messiah. He's going to restore the earthly kingdom. He's going to kick Rome out. 
He's the one that has the power and the authority and the ability. He can heal you when you're wounded. He can raise you from the dead when you get killed. He can feed you on a, on a happy meal. And we can go to Jerusalem and kick Rome out. And they go, oh boy, uh, we got an inside track. Jesus, we want to sit on your right hand and on your left hand. I want to be your vice president. I want to be your secretary of state. I want to be right up there in the echelon, the upper echelon of your power and your authority. What Jesus came to do had nothing to do with that. And they missed it. And his unwitting request, Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup? And primarily in the Old Testament, the cup was the cup of judgment. It was the cup of God's wrath. And Jesus there in Gethsemane, he prayed, Father, let this cup, this cup of judgment, this cup of wrath pass from me. But nevertheless, not thy will, but thy, my will, but thy will be done. He said, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? The judgment of God upon sin. Now, I said, you're going, to, you're going to experience this later on. You're going to die because of your faith in me. You're going to experience the rejection and the isolation and the persecution that I'm experiencing. You're going to experience that later on. But for this moment, those that are going to be on my right and on my left, is not mine to give because the father's already planned that out end up to be what two criminals and by the grace of god one came to jesus for eternal salvation it was an unwitting request they really did not know what they were asking for and it was an untimely request again again Jesus said, you're going to experience this, but not now. They weren't ready to experience it. They didn't understand what was going on. After the resurrection, after he reminded them from Scripture over and over again, after they, as, as Acts tells us, when the deacons, kind of deacon uh, servants began to function in Acts, one of the reasons Peter said, we must devote ourselves to the word of God and to prayer. They had to continually understand and reinforce the message of the gospel with their understanding, saturating their mind, saturating their heart with the word of God. And by the way, that's what we need to do. We need to be people of the book. We need to read it, meditate upon it, memorize it, and fill our heart. In fact, when Jesus prayed for us, John 17, 17, he said, Father, sanctify them by truth. Thy word is truth. Um, the gospel is sufficient for salvation it's sufficient for sanctification um, I shared a song in fact I almost sang it this morning but our time was limited um, <laughs> the same love okay? and, and the bridge of that he's calling, he's calling he's calling us to the cross he calls us to the cross for salvation, and he continually calls us to the cross for sanctification. Now, the ten's reaction. They weren't happy. Uh, they were in, our text tells us they were indignant. And I, I think it's implied they were contentious. They got in a big argument. In fact, in, in, in uh, uh, the Gospels, even when they come to the Lord's Supper, they're still arguing with one another, who's going to be greatest in Jesus' kingdom? They still haven't got it yet. It's not until after Jesus resurrected that they get it. But they're arguing about who's going to be greatest. They're indignant with James and John trying to get ahead of the, the curve and try to get on the inside track. And there's, so there's, there's just this, among these 12, it's just going at it. They're going at it. They're going at it. I think in some ways Jesus said enough. Enough. Now in John's gospel in chapter 13, he pulls the cord by taking off his cloak and putting on the towel and washing their feet. I think it was a humbling experience to them 
that here the Lord and Master, the Messiah, is taking the lowest position of a servant and washing their feet. And he said, this is what you're, how you're to live. Uh, in fact, our text tells us, if you want, if you want to be great, you've got to become a slave to all. And so uh, they were in the dark. They didn't get it. And so here's Jesus' reprimand. It's not about power. I think that's the problem here in America, isn't it? That's the problem with Washington. It's about power. That's what they're striving for. Not the good of the people, but power. Because I think that was in the heart of Satan when he rebelled against God. He wanted the power. That's the temptation he gave to Adam and Eve. You'll be like God. That's what we're seeing fleshed out in our culture, that I am, I think I mentioned this Wednesday night, I am the arbitrator of my life. If I want to identify as a woman, you have to yield to that because I'm in control. Ignore biology, ignore science, It's what I want. It's what I want. It's me. It's me. It's me. It's about power. Jesus says not about power. He said the Gentiles, that's how they exercise. That's how they live. Their rulers, and this this is aggressive, cruel power that Jesus is talking about. He said the the people of the world, that's how they live. And we see that fleshed out in our nation and in our world and Jesus is telling them it's not going to be so among you your desire is not for power your desire is to serve and to be a servant it's not about greatness I think that was part of Moses problem I think his mom instilled in him because she was able to raise him for at least a period of time or his formative years as his nurse I think she instilled in him a sense of destiny. And when he was 40 years old and he saw these uh, two guys fighting, he broke it up, and then he saw this Egyptian uh, fighting one of his people and ended up killing him. Because he had this sense of destiny that he was going to be the leader of his people. And he ends up fleeing and spending 40 years on the backside of a desert, herding sheep, until God's timing came and God called him. And it wasn't his power, it wasn't his expertise, it wasn't his prowess, it was the power of God that was upon him. In fact, when God told him, throw your staff down, and turned into a snake, and God said, pick it up, Moses said, what? And he started to pick it up, and then when he picked it up, it became a staff again. And many times, as you read the Old Testament, that rod is referred to not just Moses' rod, but it's referred to as the rod of God. And it was the rod that Moses held out across the waters of the Red Sea, the part of the Red Sea. It was the rod that God told him to strike the rock, and the water came out. Because the power was God. It wasn't Moses. It was God working through him and the authority given to him. But the disciples were looking for power. They were looking for greatness. And Jesus said it's not about power. It's not about greatness. It's about salvation. I think this is about the third time he's told these, if you want to be first, you've got to be last. Again, but we can't chastise him too much because it goes over our head a lot. But he says, the son of man, it's the reason I came. He said, it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant and must be your slave. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Not a select group, he says, of all. For even the Son of Man, and this is a messianic title. In some respects, it's a title that identifies Jesus with us in his humanity. But most of all, and that's why it's capitalized in most translations, This is a messianic, going back to Daniel um, 7.14, I think it is, when the Son of Man who comes from the Ancient of Days. 
is going to come in the clouds. That picture of coming in the clouds is a picture he's coming in judgment. He's coming in authority. This is talking about really his second coming, that he's going to come in the clouds. In fact, that's what he says to the high priest there at his rest. When you see the Son of Man come in his authority, come in the clouds, because he is the Messiah. He is God of very God. But that, that one, this God of very God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the creator of heaven and earth, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to die on the cross. It wasn't a mistake. He wasn't overenthusiastic. He wasn't delusional. Uh, he wasn't deceived. He came to give his life, and I am so glad he did. I am so glad that God did what the law could not do. I'm so glad that Jesus identified with us in the incarnation, and that Jesus, he was saved by his life because he lived a sinless life and fulfilled the requirements of the law, and then he died that substitutionary death to take our place, the just for the unjust, the righteous for the unrighteous. He came to ransom us and to redeem us. And again, that's why I like to sing almost regularly. We're kind of limited, but I like to sing songs about the cross. I like to sing songs about the blood of Christ because he paid the price that we could not pay. So for us, it's not about prestige. It's not about greatness. It's not about power except the power of the Holy Spirit working in us to transform us and to make us more like Jesus, to make us effective light in the world, effective salt in the world. It's about his power transforming us for his glory. Let's pray. Father, help us to know your word, to believe your word, and to obey your word. We thank you, Father, that Jesus was willing to walk that lonesome load, to walk it by himself. He, he wasn't dragged to Jerusalem. He walked ahead of them. He was leading them because he was committed to do your will that we might be saved. So, Father, help us to humble ourselves before you each day Help us to lay aside our ego, lay aside our ambitions, except the ambition to please you. That, Father, we might live a life that brings you glory and points others to Jesus. Help us, Father, to have confidence in the gospel, as Paul said, to not be ashamed because it's your power and salvation. Help us to share it and proclaim it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, uh, Take My Life, Lead Me Away.
send me, Lord. Here am I, send me, Lord. Make my life useful to Thee. Amen. Uh, prayer requests, again, we pray for Dennis. Um, and.